Cities After is a bi-monthly podcast about the future of cities. Grounded in our daily urban struggles, it is part dystopian and part utopian. My intention is to entice your civic imagination into action, because we know that a more just and sustainable urban future is possible. This is Miguel Robles Duran, and I dare you to imagine our cities after. COVID, COVID. global warming, Extract. gentrification, Exploitation. homelessness, Exploitation. racism, colonialism, patriarchy, hunger, police brutality, private profit, capitalism, capitalism, capitalism. This podcast is made possible by Democracy at Work. I started last episode by mentioning a few extreme weather conditions that had taken place in the spring of this year. Since the summer solstice happened last Tuesday, June 21st at 5.13 a.m., I will begin this episode by mentioning some extreme weather conditions that have occurred since. But before I do this, if you have not listened to the previous episode, I encourage you to do it ahead of listening to this one because I introduced a few concepts that will be useful for following this episode, which is part two of the series. One day before the beginning of summer, Abadan in Iran suffered one of the highest pre-solstice temperatures ever recorded and so far the highest temperature on Earth this year, reporting a scorching 52.2 degrees Celsius or 126 degrees Fahrenheit. The heat wave in Europe continued, where last week France reported over 200 record-breaking temperatures, and all-time highs were also recorded in Switzerland Austria, Germany, and Spain. The Netherlands just had its first deadly tornado in 30 years. The US was also battered by a heat wave. Spanning from Texas to Dakota, with extended drought conditions and temperatures of over 40 degrees Celsius becoming the standard. In China, The water levels in over 100 rivers have surged beyond flood warning levels, triggering its worst flooding in decades. To make things even worse, these floods have coincided with a massive heat wave that has driven the electricity demand, think air conditioning units, to the highest ever recorded. These extreme weather events are now the norm. One after another, we expect them and they alarm us less and less. But it remains difficult to grasp how these extreme weather conditions force us even deeper into a death spiral that sustains the consumption patterns of our unendurable lifestyles. For example, how is the province of Shandong in northeastern China responding to the record demand for electricity? The answer should not surprise us. Almost every country responded in the same way. Li Keqiang, the premier of the State Council of the People's Republic of China, demanded an increase in coal production and the capacity to burn more fuel or fossil fuels to avoid the blackouts. I don't need to explain how the simple deadly cycle goes. For humans to survive extreme temperatures, we need more electricity that powers air cooling devices. In most instances, this requires the burning of more fossil fuels, which in turn produces more carbon emissions that can contribute to even more extreme temperatures. Now, to get us out of this simple dead cycle, the standard solution that one hears from environmentally concerned politicians, the media, and positivist scientists is to increase the research and technological production required 
to transition to the provision of green energy rapidly. Thus, we all are led to believe that more green energy equals a better chance for the survival of our species and our planet, right? I tried to explain this positivist mode of thinking in the previous episode. When one tends to process the understanding of an issue in a linear way. For example, this is how Eric Adams, the current mayor of New York City, is trying to solve the rise of crime. He is calling for more investment in the police force and surveillance technologies. Like most politicians, Eric Adams is a linear thinker. Positivist thinking is also highly deterministic. After all, it is the product of the classic scientific method in which experiments are conducted by controlling and isolating variables. And solutions are found in precisely contained environments. Needless to say, this is the reductive way the majority of us are trained to think. Like Eric Adams, we think of solutions as if they were problems and the problems we face are static and simple. We are trained to solve a straightforward mathematic equation on a white sheet of paper. Nothing outside of that blank sheet of paper matters. The solution is obviously inside the paper. One plus one equals two. Or fossil fuels produce harmful green gases that are hitting the planet, the solution is to find fossil fuel alternatives. We find a plentiful and clean energy sources and the climate crisis is solved, right? Perhaps this could be a quick fix if this was a world where robots ruled and capitalism did not exist. But we all know it is incredibly more complex than that. So why do we keep on thinking in a positivist way? Why do we keep trying to find linear solutions? Let me say it loudly. In an ever evolving planet and society, there are no solutions. The climate crisis has no solutions. Urban issues have no solutions. The climate is not a problem that you solve. Our planet, its inert components, all its living species, and our society are constantly in motion. They are always co-evolving and being transformed by each other. None of these are static elements that one can simply abstract as variables in a mathematical equation on a white sheet of paper. The climate is composed of dynamic systems and meshed in relational spatial temporalities. And yes, these dynamic systems include humans and their social behavior. Since the 16th century, the dominant social behavior has been capitalism. Learning to think dynamically, relationally, and ultimately dialectically is what this summer series of Cities After will be about. What better way to do so than by talking about the climate crisis. Dialectical thinking requires that we look at the planetary crisis through a multiplicity of co-evolving components and transversal conditions, some more dominant than others and some more permanent than others. This was one of the biggest lessons that Marx left us how to see capitalism in motion and look at all its derivatives in relation to what accelerates its movement. 
And as many of us know, this is the relentless pursuit of surplus accumulation, aka profit. So, to dialectically address the climate crisis, we would not only need to look into the prevailing dynamic conditions that contributed to the rise of different forms of technological development, and this, of course, includes urbanization, and these conditions which depend on extractive industries, their immediate destruction of nature, and their emission of greenhouse gases, but also we have to look into how these conditions are socially constructed and affected under capitalism. I know, it sounds complicated, and I'm sorry to say that it's even more complex than it sounds. But we must begin somewhere. So for our first in-depth case, I want to talk about the electric car. One of the most popular positivist solutions to our climate problem. This means that we will first need to look at the electric vehicle from a positivist perspective. I'm sure you will all be very familiar with this first ultra-linear angle. Here it goes. They say that electric cars are environmentally friendly because they don't produce carbon emissions. Therefore, they don't contribute to global warming, air pollution, noise pollution, and the fossil fuel industries. That ultralinear angle is too simple, isn't it? That is how Eric Adams talks about electric cars. So let's then talk about a more complex angle. We're still positivist. The typical findings in a plethora of scientific papers that have been written on the environmental friendliness of electric cars since the launch of the first commercially successful hybrid vehicle in 1997, the Toyota Prius. After scanning hundreds of these papers, I found three significant specific variables that dominated their analysis. Number one was the vehicle's carbon emission life cycle. Number two was the car's recyclability with much emphasis on the production and disposing of batteries. And lastly, I found many papers that looked deeper into the production of electricity and how that electricity was needed to charge the car's batteries. To give you an idea of what the electric car carbon emission life cycle papers talk about. Let me quote one that I found summarizes very well the many others. The article is titled, I quote, Environmental Impact of Hybrid and Electric Vehicles, a Review, end of quote and was written in 2012 for the International Journal of Life Cycle Assessment. So far, this paper has been cited over 300 times. Let me quote one of its conclusions. The research has found on well-to-wheel studies comparing fossil fuel and electricity use as the use phase has been seen to dominate the life cycle of vehicles. Compiled results suggest the global warming potential of electric vehicles powered by coal electricity falls between small and large conventional vehicles, while electric vehicles powered by natural gas or low carbon energy sources perform better than the most efficient internal combustion engine vehicles. Electric vehicles results in regions dependent on coal electricity demonstrated a trend towards increased sulfur oxide emissions compared to fuel used by internal combustion er engine vehicles. A lot of jargon here. But to summarize, 
The researchers on this paper concluded that the life cycle of electric vehicles that were charged with electricity produced by natural gas or renewable energy sources made them more environmentally friendly than those charged with electricity produced by coal. And even those cars charged with coal electricity were environmentally friendlier than cars that used regular gasoline or diesel. Let me now quote one of the papers that looked into the environmental friendliness of battery manufacturing. This is from a paper titled, and I quote, The Contribution of Lithium-Ion Batteries to the Environmental Impact of Electric Vehicles, end of quote. Published in the Journal of Environmental Science and Technology, it has been cited over 800 times. So part of their conclusions say the following. I open quotes. The share of the environmental impact of electric mobility caused by the battery, measured in echo indicator 99 points, is just 15%. The impact caused by the extraction of lithium for the components of the lithium ion battery is less than 2.3%, according to the echo indicator of 99 points. The major contributor to the environmental burden caused by the battery is the supply of copper and aluminum for the production of the anode and the cathode, plus the required cables of the battery management system. This study provides a sound basis for a more detailed environmental assessment of battery-based electric mobility. All the facts taken together, the result of the life cycle analysis, the various sensitivity analysis, the modeling applied, the assumption for the used electricity mix, etc., suggests that electric mobility is environmentally beneficial compared to conventional mobility. The lithium-ion battery plays a minor role in the assessment of environmental burden of electric mobility. End of quote. In short, this article concludes that lithium-ion batteries are not that bad. All in all, electric vehicles are indeed environmentally friendlier, according to this conclusion. This is a similar conclusion I found in the many papers I scanned. I really don't want to bore you with more quotes from scientific papers. I actually believe that these two are enough to make my point about positivist thought and electric vehicles. If you are more curious, of course, you can go to Google Scholar, search for environmental impact of electric cars, and you will find more than a million entries to feed your curiosity. So most of these scientific papers isolate variables to find results, and in some cases, recommend solutions. By doing so, these papers promote deterministic or reductive truths in their conclusions, which result, of course, from positivist thinking. If you think about it, the overall life cycle analysis just focused on what they call the actual carbon emission of an electric car. And this by looking at how the electricity used for charging is produced and how much greenhouse gases are released in this process. The analysis of the lithium-ion production just looked at the carbon emissions produced in the manufacturing of battery cells, including the extraction of lithium, aluminum, copper, and other metals. Do you see how incredibly reductive they are? Shouldn't a proper life cycle analysis include an approximation of the electric vehicle's complete production chain? including its social means of production? Let me elaborate a bit on that. So, an electric coal plant, a natural gas plant, or a hybrid solar plant 
doesn't just emit greenhouse gases while producing electricity. That is just too simple. A coal plant must extract coal. A natural gas plant must extract gas. And a hybrid solar plant must extract rare earth metals. This means that coal and metals need to be mined. Gas most certainly needs to be fracked. And these processes are highly polluting, with dire social and environmental consequences, such as the chemical contamination of rivers, lakes, and oceans, the extermination of animal species, the erosion of natural habitats, and the destruction of productive soils. Not to mention the negative impact on the health and livelihood of those that work or live in the surroundings of the sites of extraction. Where are these environmental factors in all of these scientific papers? And these factors that I'm just mentioning are just scratching the surface of the complete ecological impact of an electric car. From a dialectical perspective, analyzing the environmental impact of the electric car by focusing on the electric vehicle is simply a mistake. It is essential to form a relational map of the subject of inquiry vis-a-vis -vis the capitalist dynamic in involved in its production. This means that for understanding the electric car's environmental impacts, we need to look at industries that directly enable the utilization, promotion, manufacturing, selling, and disposing of the electric car, together with the significant indirect industries that economically benefit from it. And all of this has to be done on local, regional, and global scale. So, which industries enable the utilization of electric cars? I can now think of, uh, let's say, the construction industry. Specifically, the ones involved in the developing of road infrastructures. And these industries demand the production of cement and asphalts, right? These are incredibly polluting production processes, not to mention the environmental impacts of all of these concrete and asphalt roads in relation to immediate climate changes, to the destruction of habitats for animals and other species. Other indirect industries that benefit from the construction of roads, for example, could be the epoxy paint industry, which is also highly pollutant and the heavy machinery industry, uh, its manufacturing impacts uh, and its reliance on fossil fuels. The production of suburbia, housing, and its industries, which is by far the most unsustainable way of living, is also connecting, connected sorry, with the enabling and promoting of electric cars. Other promotion industries are the political lobbies that aim to defend and perpetuate polluting industries. How could one measure the environmental impact of their lobbying? On the manufacturing side, you have metal mining, plastic production, rubber factories, and the global transportation chains of enormous fossil fuel hungry shipping vessels that bring the goods into assembly lines full of highly exploited workers that live in environmentally unsanitary slums in the surroundings of the factories. On the selling side, you have constructed massive networks of electric charging stations or car dealerships that indirectly connect to many service industries operating from air-conditioned office towers. I could go on and on making more relational connections to the environmental impact of the electric car. But I hope so far I was able to communicate my point. 
the electric car won't solve the climate crisis. Not even close to it. And we can find this out just by doing a very simple dialectical analysis of everything that is involved in this. I know dialectical thinking sounds complex because it addresses complexity. It has to be this way. Still, in my view, there is no other way to reveal and confront the extent to which capitalist industries have been interconnected in the continuous destruction of our planet and all living species in it. Environmental impact is much more than the direct impact of a product on carbon emissions. Still, capitalism wants you to believe it is just that. They want you to believe that we can fix the climate crisis just by changing our consumption patterns. Don't buy gas cars, buy electric cars. But really, if we don't aim to transform the production patterns, we all are doomed to extinction. For this, we need to learn to make relational connections that matter. We need to think dialectically. Sadly, all of those scientific papers won't make these connections. This is why we urgently need dialecticians at work and why we must revolt against positivist thinking. This was another episode of Cities After. Thank you for listening and don't forget to subscribe.